Good morning, Pathway. It's good to see everybody here. My name is Brian Beal, and I'm one of the spiritual formation pastors here. And if you're joining us online, we're so glad that you're worshiping with us today. And if you're new to Pathway, during this service, you got sermon notes on the way in. You can open that up. There's a QR code that talks about our Connect card. We'd love for you to take a moment during this service and fill that out. And if you've been around Pathway a while, sometimes we reach out to you and we say, hey, we haven't seen you in a while. And you'll say, no, we've actually been here every weekend. One of the reasons why is it's easy to, to miss each other when we don't check in with each other. So if you take a moment, if you've been away and you're back, we're so glad that you're here. You can fill out a Connect card anytime. If you have a prayer request, it's the easiest way to let us know how to pray for you and for your family. And if you want to take a next step, that Connect card is an easy way to let us know what God's doing in your life and what you want to do next. This is going to be a great service. We had the Carroll High School Jazz Band out, out there playing while we came in today. And we're going to take some time. We're going to sing some Christmas songs and uh, we're going to receive communion. And, and if you didn't get elements on the way in, if you're on Online, make sure you take a moment and get some bread, get some juice. And our team's going to uh, walk down the aisles a little bit. And if you didn't get elements, they'll have those. And you can raise your hand and let them know. And uh, we're going to do that. We're going to have a moment. We're going to give. And then we're going to receive offerings. And then we're going to uh, open up our scriptures. We're going to continue in our series, Do You See What I See? And so this is going to be a great service. And we are praying that God is going to speak in your life. We invite you to stand where you're at. Find somebody that you don't know. Introduce yourself and welcome them this morning.
some of our team walking up and down the aisles. And if you didn't get elements on your way, I encourage you to get those right now. You're going to find on there, there's two pieces of plastic. There's two layers. The first one has the bread and then you open up the second one very carefully and then it'll have the juice. And if you're online, we encourage you to get your elements ready as well. And uh, so just so you know, if you're new to Pathway, we believe in open communion, which means that if you have placed your trust in Jesus Christ, you are welcome to do this with us today. We're glad that each of us get to do this. I was thinking about it this week, thinking about this moment, and I can think that, uh, or I can assume that for some of us, we're thinking about this, this act of worship, and we're thinking that this is an Easter thing. Why are we doing this at Christmas? And there's a couple of things that we see in Scripture that really points to this. So we go back to the beginning, Genesis 1 and 2. These first humans are walking the earth. They're enjoying a face-to-face -face relationship with God the Father. And it's amazing. Sin separates them. And from that day forward, God has been working to reestablish the connection that he once had with us. And we look at the Old Testament, we see these breadcrumbs, we see these seedlings of these moments of teachings and prophecies and promises where we're seeing the act of God moving toward humanity in a way that he's restoring things. But then comes Jesus, this babe, this, this infant, this incredible gift that we have, fully human, fully divine, in perfect union. This child came to restore everything. And we now have a taste of what Adam and Eve had. We're not there yet. We'll get there one day. But when we celebrate Christmas, we're celebrating Easter because this infant didn't just come to live and die. This infant came to live, to die, to be resurrected so that we could have relationship with the Father. And that's why we do this. And so this act of worship is connected to Easter and Easter is connected to Christmas. And so we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Whenever you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so we take the bread together. Paul says that after dinner, in the same way, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant of my blood. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so we take the cup. We pray over us. Jesus, we are so thankful for you. That you would leave the Father. That you would join us. That you would become one of us. That you would live in our broken world. The world that we broke with sin. That you would exist in such a way that people would be drawn to you, that people would find you, that people would understand what it means to follow you. And so today, we remember. We remember that there was a mother who trusted in her heavenly father. There was a father who adopted a son and raised them, raised him. And Father, they, that, that, the parents, they gave their life so that Jesus would have the best chance to do the thing that he came to do, which was to love us, to lead us, 
to convict us, to show us the way to the Father. And then he left, and he left behind the Holy Spirit who now guides us. And so we are thankful this Christmas. We are thankful to have a relationship with Jesus. As we continue in worship, Father, I pray that we'll continue to direct our lives, our hearts, that we'll be listening to what you have for us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you stand? Let's continue to worship.
Jesus, we just celebrate that you came into this world. We celebrate with joy that you came to rescue us from our sin. We remember that you have come for us, that you loved us with such a great and unfailing love that you would rescue us. And so Jesus, we just respond to that and say that you are our king, that we worship you and that you reign above it all. Lord, we love you. And so it's in your name we pray and worship and do all these things. And everyone said, amen. You guys are welcome to take a seat. Can we thank God this morning for our worship? Yeah. We've got a team in this room. They're going to come down here in just a moment, and uh, we're going to receive our tithes and offerings. And one of the ways that which we can continue in our worship is living with our hearts wide open, hands open, everything in our life wide open to God to do whatever that he wants to do. We get to see incredible signs of generosity all around this place. In fact, um, maybe some of you got a, a, a tag off the giving tree. And it's incredible that we get to step behind or step beside people that are walking this Christmas and things aren't going well. We're gonna be a blessing, a force of blessing in their life this Christmas, and so thank you. If you took a tag, you need to know that that's due today, and maybe you forgot that, you're just not remembering that you needed to bring that in. That's okay, because you can do that later, you can bring it in. You also have tomorrow and Tuesday to bring it back here and drop it off at the tree anytime when the church is open, and then you can stop by our offices off of DuPont Road and drop that off also. If you're gonna be, if it's gonna take longer than Tuesday, you need to contact the people on the back of the tag and let them know so they can be prepared for that. I'm gonna invite our team forward, and they're gonna come, they're gonna pass these buckets, and as they come, I wanna tell you about Christmas because Christmas is coming, and we're going to have uh, uh, six identical services, and it's gonna start on Thursday before Christmas at six o'clock, and then on Saturday from three and five, three o'clock and five o'clock, and then Sunday, one, three, and five, and we hope that you'll come and be a part of one of those. It's gonna be incredible, and, uh, and look in your sermon notes, there's more information in there about what's coming, and you guys can pass those buckets, and and we're gonna prepare for our uh, next sermon and do you see what I see? And uh, so get your sermon notes ready, get your scriptures ready, and let's watch this together. God, I know that you are good. I know that you are faithful and all powerful, but God, I don't know. I, I'm not seeing it, I'm struggling. Lord, how could you use someone like me? I'm broken. I don't have the gifts. I... God, there's so many other people that can do better. Lord, I want to believe, but I'm struggling. God, help me see what you see. Do you see what I see? I had somebody ask me the other day, uh, where'd, where'd the title come from? And uh, I said, well, I said, there's not a whole lot of preparation put into this. I was actually at a coffee house and thinking about Christmas. And Christmas, it's always the toughest time of the year to think about a series because you got to do a, a Christmas series every year. Like Easter comes along, people ask you, what are you going to speak about on Easter? Um, resurrection? You know? Christmas, we're going to speak about Christmas, huh? <laughs> the, the birth of Jesus, and, and, uh, and so I was sitting there, and I was thinking about it, and all at once that little song came to my mind, and that little line, do you see what I see, and I thought that would be a perfect Christmas series, and so that's how, nothing deeply spiritual about that, but uh, then the more that we talked about it, the more that we thought about the fact that, that really uh, the title is good for us walking into Christmas, because a lot of times we could look at it as, do you see what I see in Jesus, but it's really what does Jesus see in us? And as you think about just that idea of what does Jesus say in us, you know, this series really speaks to, I think, three things, three areas of our lives. One is that when I look at myself, what do I see? And when Jesus looks at me, what does he see? And when I look at Jesus, what do I see? And our relationship with Jesus actually determines what we do with Jesus our relationship with Jesus actually determines how we see ourselves because if, 
if we really understand how Jesus sees us, we see ourselves differently. We understand the depth of our identity and who we are in Christ. And so, really what Christmas does is Christmas challenges us to get up close and personal with Jesus, to see Jesus and to understand who Jesus really is and, uh, and what he came to do, but also to see what we mean to Jesus. And, and, uh, and so, there's really good reason in walking through a series like this and really asking ourselves, what do you see that I see in Jesus, but what does Jesus actually see in me? Because when we look into the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what we see is we see that, that really the writers of the Gospels are trying to help us to understand who Jesus is and to actually to know the depth of God's love for us and the fact that he wants to engage with us personally and intimately and in a very transformative way. And so, you know, we, we, we come to Christmas realizing that, that it's all about Emmanuel, God with us. It's all about the fact of Jesus, who's the Savior of the world and what that means to us. And then the writers, the gospel writers, are trying to introduce these audiences to an understanding of the truth of who Jesus is. Matthew, he's actually written, writing to Jewish Christians of his day. Uh, Mark is writing to the Gentiles, really in Rome. He's all about action is what he is. Luke is writing to Gentiles or Greeks, and John, the book of John, I want you to turn to John chapter 3, very familiar passage for many of you, and for many of us. John is written to both a Jewish audience as well as a Gentile audience. He wants the Jewish readers to, to really understand who Jesus really is. He's the Messiah, and he wants the Gentile readers, the audience, to understand that they are a part, they can be just as much a part of God's plan for salvation for them as, as the Jewish listeners would be as well. And so when we look into the Gospel of John, uh, John's uh, purpose is to present Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, sent to earth, and I don't want you to miss this, uh, sent to earth to fulfill all that the Old Testament, all that the Old Testament anticipated. And so in the book of John, when Jesus is having dialogue, especially with Jewish leaders, many times he's referring back to the Old Testament, to those prophecies in the Old, to reveal really who he is, because they were confused as to who he is. And so John, again, the purpose is to present Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, sent to earth to fulfill the Old Testament, what the Old Testament anticipated, bringing new life and eternal life to a very dark world. And so John's gospel doesn't begin with the birth of Jesus. John's gospel begins with helping us understand who Jesus really is. That Jesus is the word that spoke all things into existence. That Jesus is the life and the light of the world. That the darkness cannot, cannot overtake the light. Matter of fact, if you look in John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, this is what it says. It says, the true light <clears throat> that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, and they did not even receive him. So he came to those who were his own. He came to, to help the, the people of Israel understand exactly who he was, and yet they, they still rejected him is what they did. Uh, he says, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. And then he says, and the word became flesh, and he made his dwelling among us. Emmanuel, God with us, to get up close and personal, and to invite and build relationship with those that he encountered. And so, the relationships that Jesus builds are with people that desperately need to know who Jesus is. And Jesus takes the time to get into their lives and to help them see how he sees them, but he wants them to see really who Jesus is as well. And so in John chapter 3, we have this unique conversation that Jesus has with someone who's really seeking out the truth as to who Jesus is. It's Passover week, and Jesus has been in Jerusalem. Uh, he has begun the process of, of doing these miracles, these signs that would point to who Jesus is. And, uh, and the Jewish leaders of his day are beginning to wonder exactly who he is, and they're beginning to question who he is. And so on one particular evening, a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and he comes to Jesus, he sits down, and he has some very, very, de very definitive questions for Jesus. 
But Jesus actually doesn't answer his questions, but actually gives him some things to think about in the midst of the conversation. And what we have here is we have really this first private sit-down meeting with Jesus, with a Pharisee who's really seeking out truth. And this week, as I dug through this passage, and I've I've talked about this text before, uh, but the more that I dug through it, the more that I appreciated both the posture of Nicodemus and Jesus. Nicodemus comes to find out more about Jesus. Nicodemus comes with questions for Jesus. But Jesus, again, would give Nicodemus some questions to really ponder. So as I, as I work through this text, and this has been, this is one of those weeks where I dug and I dug and I dug and I dug. There's so much that you get uncovered within the context of this text that I think is, has been really beautiful for me, and I hope it is for you as well this morning, is I really began to think about the fact that really for, for Nicodemus, there, there are really kind of four movements that take place within his heart and his mind as he has this encounter with Jesus. The first is this, and that is that he came convinced. He came convinced Uh, He saw himself as a religious rule keeper who knew it all, but Jesus saw him as a man who had a lot to learn. (laughs) And uh, let's just look at the first couple verses of John chapter 1 real quickly. It says, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night, Nick at night, and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you were doing if God were not with him. He's saying, we're seeing these signs. And John actually records seven signs in his gospel. And these signs were the miracles of Jesus, and they were signs and wonders that actually caused the religious leaders of his day to wonder who Jesus was. It was the same thing with those who were watching Jesus. These signs and wonders were causing people to wonder exactly who Jesus was and where Jesus came from. And, uh, and so what we know to be true about, about, uh, about Nicodemus is this. Here's just a few things to think about. One is, is that he was a Pharisee. He, was, uh, he certainly was one who understood the law. He, it's very clear in that. He was, he was a Jewish leader of his day. Uh, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, 71 of the best of the best, who ruled over basically the people with the law, who understood the law, who, uh, who, who really had it thoroughly intact, and, and he'd risen to the top of the 71. Later in the text, we're going to find out that he calls himself an old man. And in Jesus' day, an old man within the community would have received a tremendous amount of respect from everyone that was watching him, and, and certainly because of where he had risen within the context of, of the Pharisees and being a part of the Sanhedrin as well. And later on, Jesus is actually calling, going to call himself Israel's teacher. That's quite interesting because as Israel's teacher, it could mean that, listen, you teach the law to the people of Israel, but there are other scholars who believe that that just maybe that Nicodemus was Israel's teacher, that he was looked upon from the 71 as being the top of the 71, that you, everyone looks to you for your knowledge, everyone looks to you for your insights, that you are the best of the best, you are number one, you have risen to number one in the camp, and here you are having a conversation with me. It says that he came representing not himself, but he came representing who? He said, we. What does we mean? (laughs) Well, there's a couple thoughts on that. One would would be is that we means, hey, listen, the Sanhedrin are beginning to wonder who you are, and they clearly sent me here to kind of spend some time talking with you. Well, if we look at it that way, we'd see this as kind of, a, of, a, of an indictment or kind of a, a moment where Nicodemus is coming in with a harsh attitude to try to trick Jesus up. Don't see that at all within this text. We don't see this as a, as a moment of trying to, t- trying to trick Jesus into something that, that he's uh, trying to catch him in something that, that would allow him to bring him to a point of, of uh, prosecution. We don't see that. But we see that there's a we here, that we, we're trying to figure you out, Jesus. But he was convinced. He saw Jesus as a rabbi. He calls him a rabbi. He said, you are like me, Jesus. We hear your teachings. We see what you do. Uh, You're a teacher that's obviously coming from God. God has his hand on you. You couldn't do the things that you do unless somehow God had his hand on you. But he was not convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. So he comes to him, rabbi to rabbi, to ask some very clear questions. And I thought about this. I thought, you know, here we have Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night in the dark. 
And, and some would say, well, that was because he was afraid. He didn't want others to know that he was having this conversation. But we knew that he was having this conversation. And at night, many times, that's when scholars would sit around and they would debate theology and talk about things. And so in the evening, he comes to Jesus and, and he begins to poke around in the dark more or less. And I, I think he's really asking a few questions. One is, I'm wondering if I'm good enough and I'm wondering if I've done enough and I'm wondering if I've even gone far enough. And so here's Nicodemus. Nicodemus was someone who chased knowledge. He needed to know. He needed to know a little bit more uh, but this encounter with Jesus was more than just an intellectual inquiry. It was spiritual, it was emotional, and it was even a relational quest with the living God. But he was in the dark. He was in the dark. He, he knew he was talking to someone who was touched by God. But he didn't know that he was talking directly to God in flesh. And so as the conversation goes on, he finds himself confused. Uh, he saw his rule-keeping and his Jewishness as his means for salvation. That God has his hands on the Jews. That Jesus saw him really as a sinner <laughs> in need of salvation. And so Jesus, this is the brilliance of Jesus. Jesus used this conversation to help all of us who are in the dark as it relates to our salvation with God to understand just how simple, just how simple it all is, and just how simple it is to actually receive that salvation. Look at verses 3 and 4. Nicodemus says, again, I want to go back to 2. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing uh, if God were not with him. And then Jesus just kind of moves, and he says, Jesus replied to him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see, can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. You're you know, the idea of, of understanding to see the kingdom of God means that the Jewish people that day, they were looking for the Messiah to show up to establish his kingdom on this earth, to free them from the Roman Empire, and to, to establish that kingdom. He says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And then Nicodemus says, how can someone be born when they are old? How am I going to, how is that going to happen, Jesus. I mean, he just can't, I don't need to draw you a picture on that, do I? He just can't figure that thing out. And, uh, and he said, surely they cannot enter the enter a second time within their mother's womb. That word born again in the Aramaic would be a nothen. It would mean to be born from above or born again or born anew. And Jesus telling Nick, hey, listen, Nick, you need a restart. Uh, you need a do-over. And you need to let go of works righteousness in which you've placed all of your hopes. He said, this is not about a physical birth. This is about very much a spiritual birth is what this is. And you must be born, you must be born again. Now, Nicodemus, in, in his day, again, if, if, a, if, a, if a Gentile became a Jew, they would say basically to that Gentile became a Jew, you've been born again. You've been born anew. And, uh, and so this idea of being born again wasn't unusual to him, but it, it was different in the way in which Jesus was conveying it to, to Nicodemus. Jesus, Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God. He goes from seeing to entering. Thus they are born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you, and now he moves it from you, Nicodemus, to plural you, whoever we is, you must be born again. And he says, the wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. What is Jesus saying here? That, that very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. There's, there's, there's several different thoughts here. Um, one is some would say, well, he's talking about believer's baptism. Well, that's not been established yet. Uh, some would say, well, he's talking about being born of water and the Spirit is the fact that you're born physically. Water obviously goes in line with the birth of a baby. Spirit goes in line with the fact of of something spiritual that happens within the context of our lives. But, but really, that is not what Jesus is saying here. I think what Jesus is talking about here is he's really talking about and trying to, trying to help Nicodemus understand 
really, what does salvation really mean? What does it mean to be born again? You can't be born again physically. This is a spiritual issue within your life. And what Nicodemus doesn't kind of key in on is that Jesus, in that moment, remember, John is talking, trying to help us to see and help us to see that Jesus is talking to the Jewish people, and he's helping them to understand who he is based upon the truth of the Old Testament. So Jesus is actually going back in that moment to an illustration in the Old Testament found out in Ezekiel chapter, 20, chapter 36, verses 25 through 37. This is what it says. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all of your idols, and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. What this is, is this is a picture of salvation. Nicodemus, it's not based on what you do. It's based on what the Spirit does. And when you are reborn, there is this regeneration that takes place within your life, and it is the Spirit of God that begins to do that and begins to then transform your life. Water and, water and spirit is really all part of this transformational process in the sense of understanding that, that actually water relates to the spirit. John 7, verses 37 through 38, Jesus said these words, Let anyone who is thirsty come and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within. And the text says, By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were to later receive. Nick's works were all about his image. The ladder of success was all about the outside. <laughs> I, was, I grew up in a home. My parents were good people. And, uh, and, and godly people, they were good people. They loved Jesus. They raised us in the church. But I grew up in a church that was very much about the rules. And you do this and you do that. And the challenge with that was that as a teenager particularly, I always wondered if God was pleased with me. And so we would have altar services at our church. At the end of every service, people would, you know, come to the altar. And so when I was a teenager, I was at the altar just about every Sunday because I was messing up all through the week. And, uh, you know, I was always wondering, am I okay? Am I okay? And I remember, I remember one Sunday, I was at the altar, and, uh, you know, I was pouring my heart out. And, and uh, I got up, and I walked out. I'll never forget. I, I can't forget this. I walked out, and the pastor's wife was at the back of the church, and she was shaking hands, and she shook my hand, and she said, Ronnie, one day you're going to make it. And I thought, <laughs> God, which ladder do I have to get up? You know, one day I'm going to make it. What I needed to have her say to me was, you're making it. You're making it. God loves you. He's with you on this. And, and so, as, a, as an older guy now, to this day, I still am wrestling, th I still wrestle through that. I grapple with grace. And, and Jesus is really saying to Nicodemus, you're making it too hard. You're, you're all about the outside. You're all about what people think. That's what a Pharisee did. They, they walked around. Everybody knew a Pharisee by the way they dressed and, and uh, by, by how they acted. But it was really the outside appearance. Why Jesus often knocked at them at times about the fact you're just kind of whitewashed tombs is what you are. You're walking around here as dead men because nothing's happening on the inside of you. A um, good example of that is, you know, before Lydia went off to school, she went down to Florida for a year, and, and so we worked on getting her car, and I won't give you the name brand of the car, and, uh, but one day, you know, and I, you, some of you know this, she was, on the, she was heading down somewhere down southern Florida, and she called me on the phone, and she said, Dad, my car, my car just won't work, and she's off the side of the highway, and I'm having to try to figure out, and, and so it was kind of killed in action, is what it was. And, uh, and so finally found the dealer that, that would take the car and, and uh, got, her into, got into the dealer, and the dealer opened up the hood and checked inside the engine, realized the engine had threw a rod, threw a rod, a rod went right through the engine. And the uh, car looked great on the outside, but on the inside, it was a mess. And, and that's really the same thing true for all of us, is that, that we can look good on the outside, but if we're not allowing the Spirit of God to take residence within our life and begin to change us and transform us, we're going to be a mess. And Nicodemus 
Nicodemus was beginning to feel a little confused. And then he felt convicted. He saw himself as knowing all things. And now he's feeling in the dark, wondering if there's more. (laughs) And yet Jesus points him to the truth of who he is and what he came to do. Nicodemus asked, how can this be? And Jesus said, you're Israel's teacher, and do you not understand these things? <laughs> you don't get this? You don't get the fact that, that you're changed by what the Spirit of God does in you? And very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still, you people do not accept our testimony. Who's our John the Baptist, myself, the disciples, obviously what's being portrayed here. I have spoken to you of earthly things you do not believe, and then how will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Again, Jesus takes him back to the Old Testament. This was an answer to a question asked in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. Who has ascended into heaven and descended? Answer, the Son of Man. Nicodemus He's feeling a little convicted. And then Jesus says this, just as Moses, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. This was a moment when Jesus was embedding in the mind of Nicodemus a picture he could not forget. I don't want you to miss this really important. He was using this moment to to bring a picture into the mind of, of, of Nicodemus that later on would move him to a point of conviction. So what what is Jesus doing here? Again, going from the old. In Numbers chapter 21, there came this moment in Numbers 21 where where God was leading the people of Israel into the promised land, and the people of Israel were always rebellious. He would bring them through. They would have a a battle. They would win the battle, and then eventually they would start grumbling again, and you brought us out in the desert to die is what you did. And there was always a a sense of discipline that came along with them, and once again they did it. And, and, And there was these vipers, these snakes that began to bite people, and they began to die as a result of that. And they came to Moses, and Moses goes to God, and God says, here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to, to take a pole, I want you to make a bronze serpent, put it on the pole, put it up in the air, and anyone who just looks, all they need to do is a little look of faith. If they just look at it, if they've been bitten by this snake, they will be, they will be saved is what they'll be. That's all they have to do, little act of faith on that. And, uh, and so that's what he did. And he put the serpent, made the bronze serpent, put it on the stick, they would get bit, as a result of their sin, their disobedience, and then they would look up and suddenly they were healed. They were healed. Now think about this. On the cross, on the cross, Jesus takes on our sin, and he becomes sin for us. That, that, that he was placed on that rod, and he was lifted up in that moment. This is a really profound moment, and import, importance for all of us as well. One of the commentators that I I spent some time with this past week said something I think. He wrote this, and I'm just going to read it to you. I didn't read it last night. I'm going to read it this morning. It says, the details of the analogy are remarkable. The snakes are symbolic of sin. In fact, the perfect symbol of sin because it was a serpent that tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, thereby bringing sin into the world. Our very natures have been polluted. Paul says there is no one righteous, not even one. Then we see the likeness of a serpent lifted on a pole. It is significant that Moses elected not to use an actual serpent. The symbolism would, have, would, have, would not have been so exact and perfect if he had. Our Lord became sin, or a serpent, for us. Romans 8, 3 says, God sending his son into the likeness of a sinful man to be a sin offering. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 adds, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. In Galatians 3, 13 states, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. With all the animal realm formed form which to choose, God chose the perfect symbol, the serpent. Our Lord on the cross took the sins of the world upon himself as symbolized by the, riding serpent, by the withering serpent. 
We do not miss the importance of the gaze of faith. Numbers 21.9 says, When anyone looked at the bronze snake, he lived. The command to look to the uplifted serpent was a gracious foreshadowing of looking to Christ for our salvation. No wonder our Lord said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Moses raised the serpent up high in the camp, and all the dying Israelites had to do was look to the pole and be saved. No matter how horribly they were bitten, no matter how many times they had been bitten or how sick they were, the opportunity for salvation was there. Even the most degraded and miserable sinner who looks to Christ will be saved. That is why our Lord used this wonderful illustration. And I think that what this did in the midst of this conversation is it left Nicodemus one of two ways, convinced or even a little bit more conflicted. He saw himself as an old man, convinced his works had saved him. But listen, Jesus saw him as an old man who needed to become a little child and who needed God to save him. Some would say that was the end of the conversation. That with the, with the serpent on the pole, Jesus left him with a picture in his mind that he would not forget. Others would say, no, there's a little bit more to it than just that. But the truth is that, that Nicodemus went away from that conversation, and I think our question needs to be, what happened to Nick? In John chapter 7, turn to it, uh, Jesus uh, is being questioned. Where did he come from? Who is he? And they're wondering, well, obviously, you know, Galilee, no, you know, can't come from Galilee. The Messiah's not going to come from Galilee. He's going to come from Bethlehem, which he was born in, in Bethlehem. And, and so they're having this moment, and, and again, the Jewish ruling council is really questioning who Jesus is and, and all that goes with him. And, and so then Nicodemus speaks up in verse 50 through 52. Actually, if we, if we go through 47, don't we have it on the screen? Here's what it says, 42 through 52. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, who is one of their own number, asked, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? <laughs> and they replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come from Galilee. There's, there's an element here where Nicodemus is defending Jesus. Some time has passed, but he's still defending. And then in John chapter 19, he shows up one more time. Jesus has been crucified on the pole. Jesus has now died. Jesus needs to be buried. And there's a rich guy who has a burial place. And this is what it says. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. He was a secret disciple of Jesus. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. And Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and olives and 75, of about 75 pounds, taking Jesus' body the two of them wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. And at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb. This goes back, actually, to Isaiah, that, that he would be buried in a borrowed tomb. He would be buried in a tomb of a rich guy, is what, he would, is what would take place here, in which no one had ever been laid, because it was the Jewish day of preparation since the tomb was nearby. They laid Jesus there. So here you have Nicodemus, who stands with Joseph Arimathea, a secret disciple, takes the body of Jesus down, the top, the best of the best, brings him down off the cross, the blood of Jesus is all over his hands, they carry him to the tomb, they wrap him, 
they embalm him and they place him within the tomb. Could it be, could it be that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were both secret disciples of Jesus? Could it be that Nicodemus, when Jesus was dying, he was looking upon that cross and he was going back to that moment when Jesus said, do you remember the serpent in Numbers 21 that was on the pole? One day you'll see the Son of Man lifted on this same pole. Could it be in that moment when, Jesus, when Nicodemus was looking at there that maybe, just maybe, he remembered those final words that, that maybe Jesus had actually spoken after they talked about the serpent on the cross that just simply say this, that for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life, whoever. Nicodemus, it doesn't matter who it is. This is for whoever. Jew, Gentile alike. For God did not send the Son of the world to condemn the world. Your sin condemns you. You condemn yourself. But to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Jesus, Jesus saw him as someone attempting to measure up to God, yet really truly needing to understand three things. The depth of God's love for him, John 3.16. The same love he described to Nicodemus is the same love that he extends to each and every one of you in the space. The degree to which God is condemning him. Your sin condemns you. Your decision to walk through life without, without surrendering your life over to, to the Lord's leadership and receiving that gift of salvation, that condemns you. But the desire of God to save him that whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. St. Nicodemus, you're an old man, <laughs> but I'm gonna tell you a truth that you simply, just simply need to accept on faith And just accept it as a little child that God loves you, that he sent his son into this world to die for you. And that if you'll just simply look and believe that the spirit of God will enter into your life and begin to change and transform you. And that's all that it takes. That we understand that we are loved by Jesus who died for us. That we are changed by the Spirit who then lives in us. And that we are called by God who works through us. I think he called Nicodemus and, Aram and Joseph of Arimathea to, to take care of Jesus. To do that work that needed to be done. And they did that work. But it began by looking at that cross and realizing just who Jesus was. Let's stand together, shall we? I just want to tell you that as we leave this morning, if you are a guest, welcome. So glad you're here. Stop by guest services on the way out. They'd love to give you something. And if you're looking for next steps, how to connect and engage at Pathway, do that as well. Uh, really important that you do that. Um, to be a part, just to feel a part of community around here and part of engaging in the work that God's doing in us and through us as well. And uh, some folks down front love to pray with you as well. Let's pray together. Lord, um, some, of us, some of us have walked into this place and we're really trying to figure out what does salvation look like to us? Maybe for some We've grown up with a works mentality that's all about what I do, and, and yet your word is very clear to us in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that it has nothing to do with what you do, what I do. 
that I'm not saved by my works, but I'm saved by the work that you did, Jesus, on that cross. And by saying yes to you, by acknowledging that, that yes, I'm a sinner, and I look to the cross and look to the work that Jesus did on that cross, and as a sinner, I ask him to be my Savior. And you kept it simple. You give us the analogy of being born again. You give us the analogy of just becoming like a child. The simplicity of faith to be able to say, I don't fully understand it all yet, but I understand enough to accept and receive. And so, Lord, I, I pray, I pray this morning for those that have never done that before, that maybe in these next few moments, in the quietness of their own heart, they would say, Jesus, Thank you for the work you did on the cross. Thank you for the fact that you took on my sin. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for loving me. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would forgive me and that you would enter into my life this day as my Savior, and as my Lord, and as my King. And Lord, keep us mindful this week of people who we come in contact with, maybe our neighbors, maybe someone within our family that is searching, trying to figure life out, who may be at a distance from you. And Lord, remind us. Remind us to be mindful of them to look for opportunities to maybe engage in conversation or to just begin to, 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 to be an example of your love and your grace and a little bit of your light in the midst of this dark world that we live in and, uh, and guide us in those conversations. Thank you for loving us well. We love you. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. See you later, everybody. Have a great week.